One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock. We're going to rock. Around. My guest today is Dale Edwards. Welcome to the program, Dale. Thank you. Tell me, what on earth is a motorbike cowboy? Well, what it meant to me was somewhere where we could meet friends uh, who had the same interests, uh, which was meeting girls, riding motorbikes and drinking booze. (laughs) And what sort of age were you at that time when it was all happening? I was one of the oldest. I was in my 20s, probably mid-20s, maybe a wee bit later. Most of the other guys were still in their teens. Right. And they all had bikes? Most of them had bikes. The odd one had a car. I had a car myself at one stage. I did see a film, I think, on the waterfront, and um, oh, yeah. there, were, there were blokes on bikes, and, t- and by today's standard, they looked incredibly clean. <laughs> <laughs> by today's standards, yeah, we were incredibly clean. We used to even nugget our leather jackets, at least I did. Uh, our teeth were even shiny and clean. And why, why was that? Well, we wanted to impress. Mainly we wanted to impress girls. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yes, things haven't changed that much. No, probably not in that, that direction. <laughs> Tell me, Dale, the thing that interests me, I was in the um, Canterbury Library and I was looking at headlines and they talked about youths causing problems and, and loitering and going to milk bars. And I found that incredibly uh, strange because you tell me you're in your 20s. What were you doing in a milk bar? <laughs> Well, the pubs closed at 6 o'clock. We had nowhere else to go. Oh, 6 o'clock closing. Yeah, the 6 o'clock swill, as they called it. Right. Tell me about the 6 o'clock swill. Well, it was bad news, I think. Uh, You'd go in there about half past five after work and there'd be a a school of you and one person would shout, and that's buy drinks for whoever's in the group. Then the next one would do the same and the next one would do the same. So you're drinking down these great big... 10 ounce glasses of beer as fast as you could so by the time you came out of the Boomer pub at 6 o'clock you were bloated and half boozed And what happened when you came out of the pub? Did you catch the bus? No, 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 no <laughs> Hopped on the motorbike, gave her a kick in the guts and away yeah. <laughs> Were the, the amount of cars on the road is that a factor? Oh, a big factor, yeah uh, you, you couldn't buy new cars even if you had the money in those days you had to have overseas funds so all the cars most of the cars on the road were old bombs that were constantly uh, repairing to keep going so it was a different ball game altogether. Yes, I, I saw in the cars for sale in in the late 1950s, about 57, I think you got uh, uh, one of those big shebs for around about £35. Yes, something like that. But you've got to remember the... Uh, the pay levels were quite low. So what were you doing at that time while you were riding your bike? Because you mentioned you were working. Oh, working, yes. Well, I, I was a plasterer. I went into a five-year apprenticeship. With whom? Uh, with a firm that doesn't exist anymore called Wilkins. Right. Yeah. But it sounds a bit like Wilkins Warboards, isn't it? It was, Wilkins Warboards. Warboards. Yeah, they yeah. made fibrous plasterboard and, and trained people to put it up and just like they do with Gibraltar board nowadays. And are you still doing that? Oh, yes. So you've stayed since the 1950s right through mm-hmm. here to 2005. Yep. That's, that's an amazing record. Yes. Mm. And, and, and did you always work for everybody, or have you had a business for yourself? What, what happened? Well, I've been so, I was self-employed from about 1968 onwards. But before then, I was working for, for firms doing plastering. Right, right. Yeah, they even worked behind the bar at one stage for friends called the Murphys. <laughs> <laughs> He's making reference uh, to the fact that Dion and I had the managership of the uh, Marine Hotel Marine in Hotel, Sumner. That's yes, right. what a wonderful time that was. It certainly was. Music and good friends, and yeah. we'll come to the 60s later in the program oh, in right, a few we're weeks' s- time. We're, we're back in the 50s. We're still in the 50s, okay. <laughs> The thing that intrigued me when you're talking is the fact that you said you were working. Was everybody working? Yes. There was virtually no unemployed. They, they reckon the Prime Minister knew the names of all the unemployed in New Zealand. Right. It wouldn't surprise me. No. It was full employment. Full employment. Yeah. So these bikers, um, as such, would go off to work in the morning, come home at night, 
rush out and get their jeans? Were they wearing jeans? Yeah, yes, jeans. Yes, Jean. we wore jeans, you know, those skin-tight, stretchy ones mainly, yeah. Yes. T- describe to me what, because you, before we came on air, said that you, you wore special clothes. Well, yeah, we wore leather jackets. Uh, that's protection for when you fell off, which you eventually do if you're riding about on two wheels. And they looked good. And uh, we used to wear World War Two flying boots. They were sheepskin lined on the inside in those days. And they, they looked good and they sounded good. They rattled when you walked. The buckles would all go. It added clank, to the impression. Clank, clank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, we did wear special clothes. Um, I actually wore a crash helmet, which was unusual in those days. People used to point at me and laugh, you know. Because you wore a crash helmet. Crash helmet, yeah. I think I heard you say that it it, it gave you a nickname. Yeah, they called me Skidlid. (laughs) Here comes old Skidlid. (laughs) There's only one wearing a crash helmet. Ah, It seems to me um, interesting, taking a bird's eye view backwards, is the fact that there seemed to be a kind of an innocence portrayed in the movies. Yes, and that's pretty accurate, you know, you, you, if you've seen that program called Happy Days. Right, yes I did, I loved it. We were basically like that, we were very naive, very naive indeed, but it was a beautiful part of our history, I guess. Um but hidden under that, was there any kind of violence? Oh yes, of course, you know, we, we were young guys who hadn't learnt to handle our booze. And we used to like to throw a party every now and again. We'd all get far too drunk and occasionally a fight would spark up between <laughs> between um, the members themselves. Um, but there was nothing, nothing malicious about it. Uh, you didn't kick anybody when they were down. It was marked with the Queensbury rules. And when you knock someone down, you pulled him to his feet and then went and had a beer with him. Nice. So it was a physical disagreement and then afterwards whoever won won the disagreement and you and you had to shout the beer? Yeah, well, sort of. Yeah, <laughs> sort of? <laughs> sort of that way, yeah. But then any group of very young people, you'll, you'll get problems like that, disagreements, and, uh, even punch-ups. And that's One of those things? Yeah, it's just part of life, part uh, of learning. You mentioned the fact that you picked the person up, you mean that the other people didn't interfere, they stood back? What happened? They stood, they'd st- stand back, yeah. So it was two blokes uh, uh, having a disagreement, settling it and then yeah. going on? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's a really interesting difference because um, there appears in young people today to be a kind of a group mentality when, when arguments come y- about. Yes, it is completely different, different. today. Yes, it's, uh, a, it's a shame really. We had rules of fair play. Basically, right. I know you mentioned that you had a nickname. Tell me some of the other nicknames. Did you all have one? Uh, not everybody. No. There's one called Silly Willy. <laughs> Silly Willy. Or some called him Wobbly Bill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, of course, was Skidlid. That was to do with the motorcycles. And but I had another nickname. Uh, to do with rock and roll dancing. I always used to wear black, so I got the nickname of Black Bart. Sounded rather sinister, but I, I wasn't. I was quite a quiet guy, really. <laughs> rock and roll. Rock and roll, Rock yes. and roll. Yes. The big love of a lot of people's lives. I know that Dion and I have enjoyed dancing rock and roll since the time uh, we first met. I think I was 13 when I first saw Dion, and... I didn't like boys at 13, so I thought, I don't think much of those blokes. <laughs> uh, and we were at a dance, but we did love the music. Yes. And um, then I met him again when I was uh, 15, and we were going to pl- a place called the Rock and Roll Club. I wasn't allowed to go to the Rock and Roll Club because that was really something quite different. All those bodgies used to go there. Yes. <laughs> bodgies, yes. what an amazing word. Tell me, were you a bodgie? Yeah, I was a bodgie. They called us motorcycle bodgies, milk bar cowboys, and all sorts of funny nicknames. Yes, I was a bodgie. I still am, I think. <laughs> At heart, anyway. At heart? You yeah. still dance? I still dance rock and roll. I still dress in black. 
Yeah. Yes, I and so it. in a funny way, well, not it's a, it's a real way. The 1950s formed who who Dale Edwards is today. Hmm, I would say that'd be fairly accurate. Yeah. What was it about the 50s that you still treasure that you hold on to in here in the uh, 21st century? Oh, well, crikey, I don't know. It's hard to put your finger just on one. Um, I suppose the honesty of the people. We never used to have to lock our houses. We I'd never, forgotten that. We never even locked our cars. Didn't have to. A burglary would be front page news. Nowadays, a, a murder's not necessarily a front page from an event. Oh, isn't that a terrible situation? I think I can remember, even though I was so young at that stage, um, the the few murders that we did have, the horror in, mm. in the society was just amazing because it would be maybe one or two yeah. in a year. Yeah, there weren't very many. No. Not from my memory anyway. No. So that's a fascinating thing, the honesty of the people. And how does that affect you today to see how it's changed? Well, it's very sad to see it changed in that direction with so much crime and violence and stealing and all this dishonesty. Um, But I suppose it all comes back to having large numbers of unemployed. Well, uh, it is a point because you mentioned the fact that the Prime Minister probably knew the names of the unemployed way back then. I was looking in in the newspapers and it was interesting to see some of the things that were happening when you touch on violence because it appeared there were things happening like um, the Suez Canal, like the IRA letting off bombs and uh, all kinds of interesting uh, things that were still violence, but we were distanced because it was so long before we heard about it. We didn't, right, we didn't yeah. hear about it straight away. Yeah, you didn't be- have, have an instant communication. communication. So you? it was over by yeah. the time it, it reached That's New right. Zealand. Yes. Well, I don't want to stray off the subject because today the subject is Dale Edwards, who, right. who tells us that he's now a, a, still a plasterer in his mature years and that he still wears black and he still loves rock and roll. And he was an amazing thing called a, a milk bar cowboy. Yeah. Where, or a motorcycle bodgy. A motorcycle bodgy? Yes. Yeah, Goodness. Another, another description, yeah. You talked about um, your group of, of uh, friends who rode bikes. Were you a gang? The media portrayed us as such, but we weren't really. Uh, we were law abiding citizens mainly. We, we used to. Love riding bikes. Love riding motorbikes. Our main crime was exceeding, uh, exceeding the speed limit. Now, that raises an interesting one. In our years together, over the friendship over the years, you've talked about a friend of yours, Wally Topsky. Ah, uh, yes. yes. the he, white Russian. Yes, he was uh, probably the most colourful member of our group, really. And uh, yes, he was known as the white Russian because that's exactly what he was. Um, he was born in Kiev in 1939. And him and his parents immigrated here probably to escape the Russian regime of the time uh, when Wally was about 11 years old approximately and uh, uh, he used to tell us how difficult it was or how funny it was because he didn't know any English at the age of 11 and had to learn. Quite different in, in Christchurch in the, at that time. Yes, yes. At that time, he stood out because of his name, Topsky. And his uh, white hair. He, and he was a white Russian, wasn't he? He, he was. He's very fair, yeah. He had very fair head and fair skin. Um, but he was a, a, a really comical character. Tell me about his rock and roll dancing style. Yeah, he was a good rock and roller, actually. And he he had a Russian version of it. So he used to do the Russian folk dance and combine that with rock and roll. Uh, you know, how they kick their feet out in front of them and bounce up and down. Um, it cries an enormous spectacular thing for, for conservative Christchurch. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. All, all that sort of thing. Um, he... Um, he used to get quite a few free beers. He used to bet people that he could blow smoke out of his ears. <laughs> and 
he didn't tell them that he had an ear infection as a child, which left him with perforated eardrums, which allowed him to blow smoke out of his ears. ears. Yeah, he Goodness. got quite a few free beers from that, that stunt. I believe he even did some interesting things on motorbikes around the Cathedral Square. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he had the fastest uh, uh, lap of the square ever, and I think it still stands even today, probably. And... Uh, of course, he paid dearly for it. He, he lost his driver's license for, I can't remember how long it was, might have been a year or something <laughs> like that. But um, in those sort of days, you could do that sort of thing without it being too dangerous because there weren't that very many vehicles in the square. That's right. Yeah, yes. so it was a wee bit different there. You mentioned the fact um, that you used to have a, a favourite ride from town to Brighton. That's right. Yeah, that, that was our... Um, our main ride would be, we'd go for a ride, go to Brighton, which is a bit funny because I lived in Brighton at the time. So you'd actually go into the town <laughs> yeah. and then have a ride back out? Yeah, yes, and uh, occasionally some of the lads would be going a bit too fast and uh, get pulled over by the traffic cop or caught by the uh, the radar. The radar in those days was very primitive. It was a great big round white thing attached to the back of a traffic cop's car and you could see them a mile off. So they didn't have too much success with that. But uh, oh, they used to cop a few of the guys and a few of them lost their driver's licence and all that sort of thing. We used to go to the Brighton Pier, basically the Penny Arcade. They had all these slot machines that you put a penny in the slot and uh, they would do all sorts of things. And uh, of course there's a jukebox there as well and that attracted us. And there's all these women machines that... Um, you could work by dropping a penny in and one was a test your strength machine this is the first time I met Dion Murphy he was a young lad of I don't know probably about 14 years of age he was in the penny arcade with a, a young school friend and they were trying their hand at this test your strength machine so I thought I'll have a bit of fun with these two lads so I walked up there and said step aside boys I'll show you how it's done <laughs> and how and, a man does it <laughs> yeah and squeeze this lever thing and the dial went round uh, to how many pounds pressure you're putting on it and, and Dion at the time his little eyes stood out on stalks and he said wow how did you get that strong so I said it's because I'm a plasterer <laughs> and for years afterwards he said he wanted to be a plasterer so he could get strong in fact he did a, a wee bit of a course at Polytech on, on, on uh, jib stopping. So, uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's funny. It's sort of turned a f- full circle. Yes, well, his son Damon has now started into the plastering trade, so it That's must right. have, something must have caught there. Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. <laughs> yes, because um, it's been interesting in the fact that you and Dion have remained friends right through that time, and although Dion and myself have travelled all over New Zealand uh, through the different cities we lived in, um, coming back to Christchurch was a real draw card because um, some things remain the same and uh, some things don't. I remember going back to look at my family house, which was uh, in Foster Street, and it was uh, right against the railways um, workshops. Oh, yes. And all my life I saw this great big fence and I never knew what went on inside that <laughs> place, except at half past four the whistle would blow and <laughs> hundreds of men would come out on, on bikes. Cause every, bikes, that's yes, right. Yes, everybody rode bikes. Yes. And sometimes they'd even have things on their handlebars, like chairs and things that they'd made while they were at work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And now when I went back, there was nothing there. All the fences were gone and there was open land. And now, of course, it's got uh, all these wonderful big stores and people shop there. So Christchurch is changing. Some things remain the same. The the railway workshops, they had a a big social hall. They used to have a dance there. Uh, It was either Saturday nights or Wednesday nights or something. The railway workshops dance. They'd have a big band, you know, five, seven piece band. And a sprung floor. Sprung floor, yeah. And uh, I used to go there quite regularly before rock and roll hit the scene. I used to go to the dancers there. The dancers also happened in the Latimer, I believe. Yes, the Latimer, yeah. That was in the early days of 
rock and roll when rock and roll was considered to be a bit on the evil side. Evil. Evil, That's... yeah. How um, could dancing like that be evil? Well, I don't know, but... Uh, it was just different. Yeah, a small group of us were dancing in one corner of the hall doing rock and roll and a larger group gathered round to watch what we were doing. And uh, the MC, which was the guy in charge of the band, walked up to the microphone, stopped the music and said, if those people doing rock and roll don't stop, they'll be made to leave. I've heard both you and Dion speak about the fact that the setup for dancing was quite different. Mm. Describe where the men and the women were. The women would be sitting on forms and chairs and that all around the outside perimeter of the dance floor and all the blokes would come in to the door and that's where they'd stand, a big group of blokes standing at the door and you know there might be a, there might be 50 females sitting around the hall and about 100 blokes because so, there was a big shortage of females at that stage. So you had to be pretty quick off the mark to well, get a girl to dance with. So there'd be a great rush, would there? Yes, there'd be a great rush. <laughs> yeah, I didn't sort of like it too, <laughs> too much because if you got turned down, it was very embarrassing. There was a, a great difference between uh, the lifestyles of men and women in the 50s. Oh, yes, there, 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 there was. You know, the, the woman stayed home and did the housework and the men went out and... You had a job to bring the money in. That's the way it was. But you know, you never had all these fancy things to spend your money on in those days. There was, it wasn't all this electronic gear. Um, the only electric gear you had was your, your stove, uh, your radio, and if you're really lucky, you had a refrigerator, but wealthy people had a refrigerator. And so yeah. what did you do in the hot weather? With your food? Uh, well, you had to buy food quite regular. Um, in small amounts? Small amounts. No f- no frozen foods? No. None at all? None whatsoever. So everything no. was fresher in a tin? Yeah. Isn't yeah. that interesting? Very narrow food range. Very, very narrow. Yes. Very narrow you wouldn't indeed. want to be um, hungry in the wintertime. There wouldn't be a great range of vegetables, would there? Uh, uh, no, probably not. But I was fortunate. Um, my parents had a, a six-acre market garden, so... I, always had vegetables. Mm, Dale, uh, you've mentioned your parents. Now, this is a really interesting thing, is that you can remember back um, to the times it would be the Depression. Yes. You can. Yes. Now, you told me an amazing fact in the fact that your mother's marriage broke up and she had nowhere to go and you slept in the open fields. Yeah, she was with a group of people who had nowhere to, to go, I suppose, and it sort of sticks in my mind. I remember it uh, and, and uh, middle of a paddock, a whole group of people, me, me included as a, as a baby, I guess, um, sleeping with a suitcase for a pillow. Right, because yeah. there was no benefits. There was no benefits, and this was at the end of the, what they called the Great Depression. Right. Yes. And that had a, that had a big effect on you because you ended up in an orphanage. Yeah, well, seeing there's no benefits, uh, if, if a woman had, was by herself and had a child, she had no way of supporting that child. So they had a thing called the Child Welfare Department, and they came and uh, took me over uh, at the age of about two. And uh, I was in orphanages and foster homes until about the age of seven, I think it was. And was that, was that an experience that you still remember? Mm, I remember parts of it, yeah. And, and what effect do you think it's had on your life? It's hard to say, really. I wasn't badly treated or anything. Um, there, was no, uh, there was no bad things associated, really, with it, I don't think. It, so it was it quite was, normal? It was a normal way to be for me, I guess. What was school like in those days? School, well, I remember my first day at school, instead of an adult coming with me, they just sent me to school with all these other foster children. I didn't know what was going on. Got into the classroom and, and this woman teacher come walking towards me and she looked like she was about 10 foot tall and her hands looked the size of dinner plates. And she put her hand out towards me and I grabbed her hand and I bit it. <laughs> 
I, yes, I can remember, remember doing that and turning around and running out of the classroom and then running all by myself all the way back home. I ran all the way. Because you were afraid. Yeah, like this great big woman, this giant of a woman with these huge hands coming towards me. I was, I was suddenly terrified. Yeah, that's, that was the only traumatic part of uh, being a foster child in those days. I went to Christchurch Boys High from 1948 to 1950. In 1950, at the age of 16, I went into a five-year apprenticeship uh, on the plastering trade. Did you ever go in the army? Yes. Well, because there was compulsory training. Yeah, it was. It? it was compulsory training uh, when you turned 18. Well, w- when boys turned 18, uh, they had to go into either the army, the navy or the air force for three months to do basic military training. And I did mine in the Air Force as a cook. Oh, and, and that's remained with you. Do you still love cooking? I don't. I don't mind cooking for other people, but I get a bit bored cooking for myself. I get a bit lazy on it. Right. So it um, doesn't affect me all that awful much. We've wandered all, all around the subject, and I'm not sure that there was uh, one thing that really intrigued me was the Monte Carlo and the, the idea of all you motorbike cowboys sitting in a milk um, bar. Milk bar, yeah, playing the jukebox basically and having something to eat. They'd be ba- they could prepare basic meals there in this Monte Carlo milk bar, like uh, spaghetti on toast and all that sort of stuff. Um, and, um, and you mentioned the word jukebox. Why was that such an attraction? Well, it had all the latest music on it that the radio stations weren't bothering to play. Because, uh, you know, they play this rock and roll music, which had a bad reputation. What about movies? Movies? Um, yeah. Did you go around and see the first Bill Haley kind of rock around the clock Yes, thing? I did. I saw rock around the clock. It was uh, one of the movie theatres in the square, Cathedral Square. I don't know if it was a Crystal Palace or, or one of those The ones. Grand, perhaps. The Grand. We used to call it the Bug House. <laughs> The bug house. There yeah. was a lot of movie theatres, weren't there? There were an awful lot of movie theatres because there wasn't anything else to do for entertainment. The no. pubs closed at six. No television. No television. No, nothing really on the radio. No, nothing that young people were interested in. No. Which was the music of the day. Um, yeah. So you were left with riding your bike? Left with riding a motorbike, yeah. Um, I had a matchless 500cc Clubman twin uh, with big pannier bags on the back. There's a whole bullock hide of leather in these bags. They were huge things. I could carry a dozen beer in each each uh, pannier bag. Um, I had crash bars mounted on them, and on the top of each crash bar I had high-speed driving lights. They're like searchlights going down the road. All the motorists that wouldn't dip their lights to you with just one headlight. When I flipped the switch and I had three headlights down the road, everybody dipped their, dipped their lights to me. It, uh, it was a nice motorbike. I liked it. And the roads were safe to drive on, ride on? Yeah, reasonably safe. Um, was but, everybody else safe from you? Yeah, yeah, really. <laughs> well, well I, I can't speak for the other boys, but me, I didn't want to get injured because I'd already fallen off once and split my head open and that's why I wore a crash helmet after that uh, so I didn't really do anything well not very often anyway where I could have got seriously hurt you now I wouldn't speed in somewhere where it was obviously too dangerous to do so um, yeah that's, uh, that's about it's it it's the good old days yeah yeah they were the good old days in some ways they were the bad old days there, there was silly rules and regulations like, for instance, you weren't allowed to have any alcohol within a quarter of a mile of a dance hall. Right. Now, think of how silly that is. A quarter of a mile of a dance hall, yep. yes. Mm. It's absolutely but silly. But I vaguely remember there was the odd... Um, what was the thing that girls used to take in in their handbags, some kind of alcohol they used to take in years ago? Oh, maybe a sort of a little hip flask or something of a spirit of something. Yes. Um but there used to be things called country clubs, uh, and, and you'd go there, there'd be dancing and all that sort of thing. Uh, but you weren't allowed to bring alcohol in. So the girls used to have it hidden under their coats, which were sometimes fur coats. And um, 
once you got inside the hall and sat down at a table, you could then bring the booze out and nobody bothered to do anything about it because it was just a silly game. Right, so the law was you couldn't take it in, but once it was in, you were right. Well, once it, once it was in, no one did anything about Not it, but it was, st- it was still against illegal. the law. Yes. It was still illegal, same as having beer within or alcohol within a quarter mile of a dance hall. Well, you've been listening to Dale Edwards, and Dale and myself, Cecile Murphy, have been talking about the happy days of the 1950s. Happy days, that's a good way to put it. Happy days, yes. Happy days. And also the how and what it was like to be a milk bar cowboy. Or a motorcycle budgie.